Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pricing Matters. This is our 10th episode, and it's a special one. Today, we have our co-founder and CEO, Marcin Chicon. Welcome, Marcin. Thanks for being with us. Uh, thank you for having me, Gabe. Can you talk about how our approach to AI is different than our competitors and what value that drives for our customers? Well, I guess the, 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 the main differentiation is our AI approach to pricing is real. But right. as I said before, bullshit free zone. So we spent, I would say, about two years evaluating the, the artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities uh, in the market, but also how they are applicable to pricing and what is the, what is the best use of this technology in our unique space. That is, uh, you know, that has to be working in the B2B environment and B2C environment, in, in which are so completely different. In B2C, you have a lot of data, but very noisy. In B2B, you don't have as many data, maybe more precise, but they can they they need a lot of interpretation. So this already you know established a, a big challenge for for our own AI functionality, um, and it has to be applicable to multiple different use cases, right? You you have to be able to optimize not only uh, the 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 price corridors or the price recommendations. You have to be able to optimize discounts, rebates, any other pricing conditions, and ideally in orchestration with the get with each other so they had there is a lot of dependencies between all of those price conditions pricing conditions or price points and how do you apply ai to 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 optimize them together so that in connection with each other they deliver the best possible approach so there was a very challenging process as i said we took almost two years to evaluate our ability to develop our own solution potentially acquire a solution or partner with somebody and we ended up, uh, uh, you know, focusing our energy on on Brenner's Analytics. That uh, is was a French startup uh, that uh, utilized um, a university, a scientific work that has been developed, uh, uh, you know, at the University of Toulouse in France. Um, that is that is that builds the, uh, the 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 artificial intelligence solution on something what is called uh, independent or autonomous multi-agent systems. Uh, so imagine like a, a multiplicity of small software robots, right? That have their own personality and they have their own mission to fulfill, and they're trying to get to the to the optimum while they're interacting with each other, like like a swarm of birds, right? Or the the the, the big groups of fishes, you know, swimming in the ocean, that changing directions and trying to to find the optimal way through the ocean without being eaten by all the sharks, right? Uh, just from from learning from each other and kind of interacting with each other, that is a very very unique system, and uh, and we 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 believe that this is going to be the best solution for us and for pricing because it is highly uh, applicable to the B2B and B2C environment, and it it is it is it applicable to all of the aspects of pricing that I mentioned before, but also applicable to all of them uh, in the multi uh, in a in a in a multi -con uh, condition environment, um, and and that's why we yeah. decided to to buy this this uh, this uh, this company and this solution and integrate it to PriceFX uh, platform capability. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that multi condition environment is also known as the real world, and uh, I think that's that's what uh you know I think uh, you know a data driven approach and the kind of segmentation optimization approach that many of our competitors take is is you know, solid and it's a good starting point, but it doesn't really reflect the real world all the time, right? And all of the, you know, potentially competing ob objectives and priorities, different constraints that you have within the business. And I think what the, you know, the, the multi-agent system allows you to do is to reflect those things to come up with a more valuable, more precise and more pragmatic approach to AI-driven price optimization. Uh, and as you said, that can reflect more uh, potential outcomes as well right so you right. might be saying your list price should do this your discount should do that and your rebate should do this um, rather than just saying hey your discount should be this right right um i think also the you know the flexibility of the model the ease of use and and the transparency right understanding kind of how you know the clear box approach as we like to call it right as opposed to a black box approach which some some vendors take in this space where you can't really understand causality you don't understand why the algorithm's recommending what it's recommending you just have to trust that it knows the best that's really difficult especially in b2b to accept right in in kind of more simplistic environments some b2c you might be able to take that kind of black box approach but 
um, I think one of the the nice things about our approach is that it, it's not like that and it's accessible and it's understandable and it's it's a uh, you know something that can be explained and, and understood easily um, absolutely so, I, I explained understood and owned right that our customers yes. can own it and they really can uh, can do it is what they believe is right for them without dependency on us or any other uh, consultancies absolutely right yeah cool so l let's shift to pricing for a minute. This is a pricing focused podcast, right? It's called Pricing Matters. So I did want to talk a little bit about how we price at price effects. And I know we're, you know, in the process of kind of looking at that and we don't have to talk about anything that's that's new or upcoming, but just in general, um, you know, for folks that might be listening, maybe they're moving into subscription or maybe they work for a software company. Um, let's talk about the value metrics that we use at price effects and, and how you decided to use uh, you know, our value metrics and, and kind of what that process looked like in terms of going through and and developing our subscription pricing model. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, pricing is the most powerful and influential lever, you know, in terms of um, influencing the profitability or, or or success in the business period. There's there's nothing more powerful than this. And um, and pricing is very much linked to the applicability um, of, of its power, which is Typically linked to the size of the of the use case, um, and that that is then linked to the revenue uh, uh, with which um, or which is being um, managed with the with pricing solutions. And I'm talking about pricing solutions in a broader sense, right? It can mm -hmm. be it can be promotion management, it can be rebate management, it can be both uh, in connection. Uh, so uh, you know, we we definitely from the very beginning uh, connected the pricing of of our subscription to the value that our solution is delivering. And that, as I said before, is uh, is connected very tightly to the scope um, of the revenue that uh, that the pricing solution is is applied to, um, uh, and and that's how we came up with a highly differentiated pricing model that works same for smaller companies, and I'm talking here mid market in the range of 100 uh, million euro revenue under management or less, um, but also works for the companies in the in the upper scale moving to billions or 10 billions or, or very large enterprises. If you look at the customer's uh, portfolio or our family, how we actually prefer to call it, family of customers, you will see you know, companies making 20, 30 million euro revenue a year and, and successfully using our application and having implemented it in less than four weeks. Those very large multinationals that take uh, you know, a little longer time to implement and, and our solution works for them, not just from the from the functionality point of view and flexibility point of view, but also from the price point point of view. So we are we understand the power of pricing, a power of differentiated pricing, and that's exactly you know how we develop our own pricing model and what we're offering to our customers is that they that they pay for the value that they receive and not a penny more. And you know what's really interesting is that we actually are tracking the value derived by our customers from our solutions. And uh, in uh, in in almost almost all cases, uh, you know the 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 companies are realizing a positive ROI from the investment in price effects in less than 12 months from the project kickoff, not from the go live, but from the project kickoff. So if you invest in in an application like price effects, you will see a positive return, um, and the the investment will pay for itself in less than a year which is absolutely unique and that just proves the in tremendous amount of value that we deliver. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was a G2 uh, comparison report that came out recently about enterprise software providers. And when you look at the ROI payback period for, yeah. and this is, you know, for folks that aren't familiar with G2, it's from the users of the software. So it's like Yelp for software, right? The okay. users of the software provide these reviews. It's completely, you know, un, unedited, unadulterated, you know, users speaking. And one of the questions they asked, so they did this this comparison report recently in G2, and they looked at 10 different categories, and, and actually price effects came out as leaders in nine out of 10. But I think probably the most salient one and the most applicable one, uh, and what we were just talking about is that ROI payback. So when you look at the other top three vendors in our space that I shall remain nameless for now, um, but you look at that their ROI payback period versus ours, their ROI payback period is 49% longer than ours. So it takes, yeah. you know, uh, almost 50% longer. Um, so so they are providing value, but because it's more expensive, it takes longer, and uh, and doesn't provide necessarily as much value. They're they're you know that that ROI payback's a lot different picture there. And I think that's that speaks to the the speed and flexibility 
uh, and friendliness of our model. Um, so I think here we go. The F words uh, of price effects. I'm very proud of of the F words. Let's talk about the F words because we've kind of talked about those a little bit. But um, you know, the the F words when I started, they they had a little bit different uh, different version of the F words, right? Um, but but I think it was the same thing, and I think dialing it into the F words um, has has really helped us from a messaging and and uh, you know marketing standpoint. But can you talk about how you came up with those those kind of foundation, uh, the founding principles, so to speak, or those you know um, you know how how you came up with those and and why they're important to our success? Yeah, absolutely, and uh, you know they they are anchored in the in the found, founding story. Actually, we didn't come up with this from the very beginning, but uh, we the the three kind of religious or found founding principles that we established at the very beginning was simplicity, relevance, and commercial fairness. Uh, you know, simplicity was really meaning how simple it is to deal with us as a company and how simple uh, our solution is to adopt, to learn, to use, to implement. And we measured the simplicity in time terms. You know, the quicker you are able to to get to, into contact or business with us without going through any legal hurdles. So, you know, I mentioned them at the very beginning, the, the entry barriers and the quicker you can implement the solution, the quicker you can learn how to deal with this and you can, you know, roll it out the better right so the time uh, was definition of the simplicity that over time turned into fast right right the second one which i just which i already talked about was the relevance right the relevance of our r d relevance of everything we're doing and we very quickly learned that the key to the success uh, was the adoption and the adoption direct directly dependent on flexibility of the solution but also flexibility of us as a provider how flexible we are and our solution is to adopt to the changes in our customer's environment, which is, as we as we talk about this before, is kind of the, the new given, the new normal. And that's how relevance kind of turned in terms of the, the one word capturing all this, all the, all this aspects into flexible. Mm -hmm. And then last, the commercial fairness, right? you know, being, being customer centric, being loyalty based, and not, you know, uh, binding people through um, through contracts and agreements uh, turned into this friendliness, right? And I think that that's, that is that really reflects who we are. Uh, that extremely resonates with our customers and the market. We are known for the F words. We we carrying them on our T-shirts sometimes, and people are like, you know, F words. You know, <laughs> is, is, isn't it offensive? And we're like, no, it's not because it's it's fast, flexible, and friendly. And, oh, gotcha. I like that. So so that that's how F words have been born. And and that's you know how they've been working for us really really well. Yeah, yeah. I like to say only one has four letters and none of them are bad, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I think part of the friendly culture is also like we like to have fun. You know, I think it's a it's a very fun culture. Um, that's been harder to to you know to experience over the last year, but uh, you know I think that's that's we certainly like to have a lot of fun both from a you know, internal as well as with our customers. And uh, we've had a lot, a lot of fun over the years and hopefully, hopefully things will come back to normal and we continue to have, have more and, and virtually until then. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so uh, I, I wanted to uh, ask you a couple of other questions. So one is, um, you know, I think we're onto something big at price effects. And I think, you know, you, you were talking a little bit about it at the beginning. Do you, do you remember a time where you just kind of thought, wow, you, you kind of had that realization that we're on to something big and that, you know, I, I know when I when I first joined, you know, there was this kind of debate over, are we more of a lifestyle company that's just going to do things the way we want to do things and not worry about becoming, you know, a, a powerhouse in the industry? Obviously, that's evolved over time. And and what you were talking about before is kind of much more indicative of the the opportunity that a lot of us see and, and think exists. Do you remember a turning point in your own mind of when yeah, you kind I, of... Yeah. Yes, I, I I think there were two, and one of them I talked already about. You asked me the question about the P and the pants innovation, right? I I literally I'm I'm serious. When when I saw this this Excel performing as a front end, and us being able to load you know thousands of rows of data in the matter of of minutes or hours, and kind of setting up the application that it can really perform its duty as a demo system or even almost ready to go live application within you know weeks and not months or years. That, at that point, I really, that's why I freaked out. That was, that was the revelation. I thought, this is it, right? Nobody has it. We are the first one to do it. This in combination with our native uh, cloud architecture and the super friendly SaaS approach, if we break through the barrier of overcoming the data challenges with this simple but powerful innovation, we, we're going to make it. And that was really true. We made a very quick 
progress in Europe, we acquired several customers and we proved that it is possible to go live in less than a month. And we, we did we did uh, celebrate uh, many go lives in shorter time than, than one month. The second uh, moment of, of truth that I thought, okay, we really are going to make it, was the decision um, uh, that we made uh, to move in U.S. And that was the time when you and you and I met for the first time, and uh, as a as a part of a conversation to uh, to you to join CrossFX, and you messed up my blender, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and you did everything possible not to be hired, and I still hired you, uh, which I which I never regretted for a second. But um, it was uh, interesting uh, uh, interview process. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the, to be serious, the move to U.S. when we decided to to, to test the waters, you know, in Europe, we were doing well, but US, you know, this big market, you know, higher maturity, a much bigger willingness to, to adopt and pay for pricing solutions, you know, awareness of the value resulting from it. It was just uncomparable with, with what we've seen in, in, uh, in Europe. And, and we did this move and guess what? Within the first five months, we acquired six customers and that was not just some small it was dana corporation it was avery dennison it was john crane right? you remember you were part of those of those sales cycles mm -hmm. and uh and the adoption and the the amazing uh, the, the, how people were amazed about what we bring and, and how unique we are was just very very special and that's where we decided to go and raise money for the first time because between 2000 uh you know 10 and 2000 so 2011 and 2015 the company was bootstrapped it was we self-financed you know we we put our own money and our own time into everything what we do but from the moment when we moved to us and we saw this tremendous success uh we started um, raising money and we went since then through uh three very successful financing rounds rounds we raised a total of uh, north of 130 million dollars um and um, and i think that i'm really very very happy and proud of what we accomplished and i think those two moments were kind of like the the turning points in the history of the company. Yeah, I agree. So what, what are the, what, from a cultural standpoint, one of the other things that we sometimes talk about, or I think has made it into our mission statement, right, is this idea of bringing the power of pricing to the people, right? Um, can you talk about that and kind of how we view, um, you know, the democratization of pricing and pricing software, pricing excellence to, uh, and really expanding the market? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I talked already about this notion or this idea that we had. Let's not, you know, connect, you know, let's not bind people with us through uh, through agreements. Let's not ask for millions of euros or dollars to to subscribe to the software or buy it perpetually and spend a ton of time and, and effort and money on implementing. Right. We saw that in the in the past decades before we incepted uh, price effects, pricing was elitary was elitary, it was only limited to big co corporations, only companies that could afford this and were brave enough to take a lot of risk, right? And we wanted to break this. Uh, so we, we declared price effects to be the solution for the people. And that means that uh, the solution is non-elitist, uh, that its power can be made available quickly, uh, can be implemented very quickly, it is adaptable means the flexibility. We talked about this before, one of our efforts. If things are changing, if environments are changing, requirements are changing, requirements are changing, you can adapt the application very quickly. It should be user-friendly because the user-friendliness is uh, a key to, to adoption. And as we know, adoption drives value. Um, it should be value-adding. And uh, above all, it should be affordable. And that's where we that's what was our you know, approach to democratization of pricing and bringing pricing to the people. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, all of this kind of finds its, its um, you know, its high point, I would say, there is a better word to say it, in the efforts, right? That's really where we, where we explain our uncompromised customer centricity. The relevant R&D, good karma is just, the, you know, the, the icing on the cake and, mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the cloud native architecture. All of this makes the application, as I said before, non-elitist, adoptable, very powerful, quickly implementable, and delivering a lot of value. That's what democratization of pricing means to us. Great, that's a good synopsis there. So let, let's let's shift gears a little bit. We've talked a lot about the company and the value and and these kind of things, but the let's talk about some personal history a little bit. Oh my so God! There's... Did I, did I <laughs> no, 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 nothing, nothing too bad. 
Um, so first of all, uh, you know, the red shoes are part of your signature, right? So for, and a lot of folks know the story behind them, but I, I thought, you know, let's, let's capture it here. So folks that may not be familiar with the backstory there can, can get the, uh, you know, the backstory on how the red shoes came to be your defining yeah. I am, I am I am I am the the freak in the red shoes. That's how people and market knows me because I really uh, wear only red shoes, and that is probably since 2013. So it's a long time. It's a seven or eight years. And imagine how difficult and challenging it is to always wear red shoes, no matter if it rains, if it snows, if you go skiing, if you go hiking. Yeah. How, how many how so, many pairs of red shoes do do you have? A lot. You don't ask. <laughs> My my wife thinks that I am worse than every woman on the on the planet. You know, <laughs> our our shoe closet is full of my red shoes, right? And and partially also our basement. But to be honest, to be serious, you know, it was it was an accident. And but it it started as an accident and it became a pretty cool thing, I think, um, and and a habit and and the kind of signature of of myself. So, as I said before, you know, we bootstrapped the company. Right? We were we were poor as in mice at the beginning, church mice, right? We 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 started the company literally with 25,000 euros the three of us we increased the capital of the company over time to 100,000 and then a little bit more so we we've, we've been pouring our own money our savings and we've been working for free um so there was not much money to spend on travel and we had to go and acquire business um so uh, the only way that we could really do this was to utilize our cars from the past that we still had and drive thousands of kilometers a week across Germany, Switzerland, Austria, France, uh, it was a lot of driving. You know, it was so much driving, sometimes we've been sleeping in, in those cars. Um, I think it's not untypical for the startup. And and because of this lot of driving, I was having always with me a very comfortable racing shoes from Puma. Uh, maybe you know those, right? With the with mm -hmm. the with the soles in the back kind of rounded and uh, with the with the signs of the Ferrari on the side. And they are they are red, like really red. And uh, and and on one of the one of the trips that I that I took to the customer, I just forgot my regular shoes, and I had to walk into the meeting with those freaking red shoes, that caught everybody's attention right away. They started asking, "What the hell is going on here?" And I just explained, "Well, I'm the guy in red shoes, right?" And it was a good icebreaker, and it kind of stayed with me. Um, and and the other part of the story was that uh, you know in the early days, as I said before. Martin and Martin, like Martin, uh, Martin Ricke, the one of the three co-founders, and Martin myself, we have very similar names. Now, Martin is a Polish version of Martin, um, and uh, and people were confusing this. It was kind of hard to kind of say Martin, 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 Martin. So they kind of get, yeah, just gave up and let's just call them M and M's, right? Because they anyway always together. They travel together. They they were the commercial face of the company for years, and they they called us M and M's. So so then we 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 came up with this thing. Okay, since we are M&Ms and I'm always wearing the red shoes, I will be red, and Martin became yellow. Um, so, uh, so my nickname right now in the company is Red, and uh, and my signature is uh, is red shoes, and uh, that's how this stayed with me for the last seven years. And I have to say, I really enjoy it. <laughs> nice. So, uh, did you ever wear red shoes when you were a competitive dancer? Oh, how you know, hell you know me too too good and you know me too long. That's that's really that's really not cool. But yes, you know, not many people know that that I actually was a competitive dancer and um, ballroom dancer. And the answer is no. I, I back then I did not. Um, I was wearing actually you know peach black dancing shoes. Um, and um, you know I, I started I started dancing in the early teenage years uh, in Poland where I was born and, and grew up. Um, and, uh, you know, being a, being a male ballroom dancer was, uh, was a quite competitive advantage with girls, right? And, you know, you, you listened to me before I said, you know, competitiveness and, and being different was kind of important in my life. Um, so if you know what I mean. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, and uh, you know, over time, I really became extremely competitive. I actually, I didn't like to dance. I still don't. <laughs> But I love the competitive ballroom dancing, maybe because of the show, maybe because of the the theater that was attached to it and and the music and, and the emotions and everything. So uh, I've been dancing for a long time, about 15 years uh, in total, started in Poland, you know, finished in uh, when I was in my early 20s, because mainly because of finishing my, my college education and, and, and going to work. Um, but I, I really enjoyed it. And I was actually not bad at this. Uh, my biggest accomplishment 
uh, was winning the Swiss championship in the in the category in the class in which I was competing at that time. It's a very long time ago, but I was pretty good at that. And that was the Latin American ballroom dancers. Nice. So one of the things you mentioned there was theater, and I know that you're also very much into film, and I think some of that's come through in some of the you know video production that that we've done over the years. I think that's really you know come to be a defining aspect of the company and the brand. So you're able to kind of you know allow some of that your your love there and and your focus you know come through into our culture. Um, so I, I think that's a pretty pretty neat uh, you know component to to price effects and that maybe that some people aren't aren't aware of. I think you actually did you major in in film or was there uh, th a well, bit of a focus? Well, thank you for the compliment. Or? Thank you for the compliment, Gabe. I appreciate that. And yes, I did major in 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 photography. So oh, photography, um, I, okay. yeah, I was my college education started in mathematics and. Uh, uh, and uh, informatics or computer science. I very quickly realized I'm completely useless uh, you know, computer scientist. Programming was not my thing. Um, so I decided to move to something else. And, um, and the something else was ec economy, economics. Um, and uh, because it was quite dry and boring, I, I figured I want to do something fun on the side. And I, and I graduated also with, in um, photography. So I was very much into, from the very beginning, I loved photography. And in terms of film, it's, it's less a film, it's more cinematography. And um, you know, when I say cinematography, I mean the very unique combination of picture, um, music, and mood. And the mood can be story or, or just feelings or emotions. If those three things come together, um, mainly you know, thanks to phenomenal you know, directors and photographers or camera people, then what's, what is the result is a film, and the film uh, you know, can be just breathtaking, right? But this is the, the combination, this is the thing that really I'm into, the cinematography and that combination. That's why I would never watch the movie on the airplane. I think that everybody who watches a movie on an airplane is just killing um, you know, the art, and you, you cannot do this. You have to have a special mood, you have to be alone or with somebody who you like or love. You have, it has to be dark, it has to be great sound, it, you have to you know, have the right impression. That's why cinematography is really one of my key hobbies, and I definitely really, really like it. And one of my dreams, um, if I manage to make some money out of what I'm doing right now, is to hopefully produce at least one uh, film, cinematographic production in my in my life. Well, I, I'd like to see that, so I'll look forward to it. And uh, let me just say, on behalf of the Price Effects family, that we're pretty glad that you don't like to watch films on airplanes, because I think we'd be a lot less productive as a company if you did. Thank um, you. <laughs> so, so uh, why don't we're about to wrap up? But I, let me just ask you a couple things uh, on a personal note. Um, you know, you talked about about films and cinematography. Can you would you mind sharing a couple of your favorites? Um, oh, there are so many. My God, you know, you really caught me off guard. But uh, you know, it's it's across the board. I, obviously, I'm a huge fan of uh, of science fiction. Right? You know, when I was 17, I saw Star Wars. You know, in the movie, in the theater, it was just breathtaking. You know, and imagine the the special effects that they had back then. What really was kind of today when you see it, it's like, oh my God, this is so old. This is so crap. But you know, that's definitely one of the films that changed my my life. You know, you know, films like uh, like The Green Mile, right? Uh, based on Stephen King that I'm reading uh, recently a lot. Uh, not the scary stuff from him, but really the, the, the good stuff. Um, you know, When Harry Met Sally, right? You know, phenomenal film, not book. Um, you know, uh, more on the romantic side, uh, which I am a little bit, I have to admit. You know, there are so many phenomenal movies I just could go on and on and on, but you have no time for this. So uh, uh, I think we'll leave it at that. All right. What about uh, any like uh, more business focused, you know, um, blogs, websites, um, articles, uh, books that you would recommend to the listeners about whether it's about pricing or just business in general or leadership or anything like that? Anything that you'd care to share there? Yeah, I will. I guess I will disappoint you a little bit um, in with in this. I am right now really into reading, and that's mainly because of the COVID situation and the fact that I'm staying at home um, all the time. And my wife has a control over me, like 100% control. So she is very, very clear about this: what I need to do and what I should do and not do. So I'm I'm living right now under very, very uh, strong, uh, strange, uh, you know, strict regime. Five o'clock, wake up. Um, one hour reading in the morning every day, no no exceptions. 
one hour walking the dog in the morning before I started. I cannot touch my telephone to take a look at the emails, then having a breakfast with her, and then I can start working. So, um, and then I have to move more in the afternoon and I have to do a little bit of a sport. So, I, man, my life has changed. You know, COVID has to go away so I can start traveling again and be a little bit, uh, uh, you know, out, out of this regime. But the very nice thing, uh, you know, about this is that I really am spending quite a lot of time every day uh, reading and uh, you know from the business books what I did read recently is uh, Simon uh, Sinek's The Infinite Game which I really liked um, so strongly recommending and this is something what we play as a company the infinite game is the game of price effects absolutely so I I found a lot of reconciliation in this book uh, compared to what we do in our company I also started reading uh, Michael Rothschild's Rothschild's Bionomics, uh, Economy as Ecosystem. Uh, Michael is, you know, is a co-founder and, and CEO of one of our partners, Profit Velocity, that is actually uh, working with us uh, or cooperating with us with the Velo, uh, you know, a very large deal uh, um, negotiation framework based on, on value estimations. He wrote a book that is, that is kind of uh, was inspirational for creation of his company. So very interesting book. I haven't read to the end, but I'm, I'm reading through it. But I'm also reading quite a lot of uh, fiction, and uh, and it's actually more exciting to me right now. Uh, I said before, I, I'm extremely into Stephen King lately. Um, not the scary stuff, the, the really, the really non-scary stuff. I mentioned The Green Mile. I, I The movie, one of my favorite movies, but also the book is phenomenal. Uh, another fantastic book that I just recently read from Stephen King is 11 uh, this is uh, a story about um, uh, JFK assassination, but from the extremely unexpected um, time traveling uh, point of view, uh, highly recommended. And uh, and and the, the book that I just uh, finished reading uh, was uh, uh, Phil Knight's um, bi- autobiography. Phil Knight is the founder of Nike. Uh, mm-hmm. The book book's title is The Shoe Dog or The Shoe Dog, and um, and I found quite a lot of interesting parallels between his founding story of the Blue Ribbon, that is the, the pre-successor company of Nike in the early stage and, and price effects. Um, so highly recommend uh, recommending those those books. Cool. Well, thanks so much for sharing your personal, some of your personal story as well as insight into the company. Thanks uh, for having me, Gabe. All right. Well, thank you very much, Martin. And thank you all for tuning in to Pricing Matters.